greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are at pedalshift.net slash 142. You can email the show pedalshift at pedalshift.net or call the voicemail hotline 202-930-1109 and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody. This is Tim Mooney back again for another edition of the Pedal Shift Project, and this is Tour Journals Volume 12, The Great Allegheny Passage by Brompton. And I am standing here in Washington, D.C. I'm standing. I'm actually decided to stand for this podcast. I don't know why. Here we are. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert. I made it. I'm here. I'm alive. It's all good. Um, but I will say this trip did not turn out the way that I sketched it out by any stretch of the imaginations. Uh, but do bike tours ever really follow a script? That's kind of what this is all about. So for the next two weeks, you're coming along for the ride. This is uh, Pedal Shift Tour Journals Volume 12, and we will cover the trip to Pittsburgh, the adventures on the Great Allegheny Passage, and a little bit more about the one and only little clown bike, my Brompton. Also, there's going to be video as well to this tour journal, as always. You can check that out over at the YouTube page or at pedalshift.net. I hope to have the video out for viewing by U.S. Thanksgiving weekend, so stay tuned for that. The Great Allegheny Passage is arguably one of the premier bicycle touring routes in the eastern half of the United States. I talk about it all the time. It stretches from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Cumberland, Maryland over a gloriously mountainy 150 miles of crushed limestone that parallels some of the great rivers of western Pennsylvania. My plan was to grab a cheap bus from D.C. to Pittsburgh, and then grab the train home at the end of my tour. On this edition of the journal, we follow along on the pre-portions of the ride and part of day one of the adventure as I ride the bus from D.C. to Pittsburgh and get rolling through the industrial parts of western Pennsylvania. <laughs> I think we'll call this day minus two or day minus three. This is uh, the weekend before I leave for my trip. I am at the base of the Washington Monument here in, you guessed it, Washington, DC. And I have just shot a video that sort of gives an overview of the bike, which I encourage you to check out. And that should be over at the YouTube channel and hopefully on the pedalshift.net homepage as well. This was the first time I've ridden any kind of real distance with the bike and it was only a couple of miles, so nothing real crazy, but able to give me the answers to a few questions, which was, hey, is this gonna work? And how well does it work? And the answer is one, it will definitely work in this setup, this configuration that I've described before uh, on the preview episode. But the thing that I'd say how well, that's a little bit more of a question mark. I tend to pack my best when I am at home and worse when I'm in the field. So the question will end up being, will this get a little more dodgy as I go along? I notice that I do have some heel strike with um, this setup. Not as bad as the worst of the heel strike that I would get with the backpack setup. I should describe heel strike a little bit. I, I think I may have just been saying it and maybe people don't realize what it is wheels of the clock. So uh, for your left foot at three o'clock and your right foot at nine o'clock, are you hitting something anywhere on the rear of your bike? Uh, this is a problem typically with bikes that aren't designed for touring. When you have a rack back there, sometimes you're, you'll be hitting the back of your heels on panniers. That's why most touring bikes have longer wheelbases. Allows you to avoid that issue. Of course, that's what my other bike is designed for. This one is, while a good touring bike, when you're mucking around with different options for attaching things, you may run into some heel strike. I thought that this setup would completely get rid of it, but there's still just a little bit. So I'm thinking about maybe uh, coming up with some ideas this weekend about maybe coming up with some kind of a spacer that uh, spans only the width of the rack so that it pushes the Sea to Summit bag that I've got on there just back. Maybe it could only be another half inch would be great. But um, of course, out in the field, uh, my results may vary. So we'll have to see how it goes. It may be something as simple as just uh, zip tying on a small block or something along those lines. Of course, then the thing that you run into is 
is this gonna fold right anymore? So maybe zip tying is not the best option. You can tell I'm thinking out loud right now, right? With my bicycle engineering, my Brompton bicycle engineering. <laughs> we'll have to see how that ends up going. But overall, uh, it's, it's, it's really a, a great setup. I'm pretty pleased with it. I think I've got a lot of room for things. And as it turns out, I'm going to need that. I looked at the burgeoning weather forecast for next week when I'm gonna be going and the lows are going to be much lower than I thought they were going to be. They're going to be much closer to the 20s. So that is cold. That's way less than I like. So I'm hoping to uh, have enough warm stuff to bring in the limited space that I've got. Um, warm stuff tends to be bulkier. Uh, I'm going to be bringing a second sleeping bag to line within my uh, rated down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit bag. That should be enough. Um, I may have uncomfortable nights rather than com comfortable warm nights. Uh, it's so funny. I'm usually battling the heat so much, and now I'm going to be battling the cold, something I rarely do. I'm going to be at elevation, and there's definitely going to be some nights that will be well below freezing. Um, now you have to start thinking about things like, is my are my water bottles going to freeze? How am I going to deal with all that? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The good news is that it does look like it's going to be dry. Um, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the weather to see how things go. I'm not going to be doing silly things. So if I do have to end up getting a uh, roof over my head, I'll get a roof over my head, so be it. Um, you may recall in past tours when I've been sort of fighting the edge of winter a little bit, these kind of like really cold nights, uh, I had Bell Star with me once and there was no way I was gonna subject her to something like that. Now me, I'll subject to things. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. Those are some of the, kind of the big ticket things that are happening here in the planning stages of this tour. Um, I'm really kind of pleased with how this bike rides. I think on the Gap Trail, it should be pretty good. Uh, weather lately has, uh, we've had some wet weather up in that region, but it's been largely drier than the, what it's been all summer long. So I think that that trail should be drained out pretty good. We'll see how that all goes and we'll have more updates uh, before the ride, before day zero hits in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania coming up. From somewhere in Western Maryland, very Western Maryland, I uh, got taken a quick break with the bus here. It's interesting, it's not a branded bus, it looks like it's an extra bus, but it's uh, getting us doing the job. We're almost to Cumberland, really gorgeous. Uh, hopefully I'll get some pictures out there for you. It looks like we're past peak, but that's all right. Um, comfortable ride so far. Realized I had made a mistake with one of my renters and hadn't gotten the place cleaned in time, but luckily my cleaner was available today. These are the things that you deal with when you're on the road and you realize because you're speeding down the highway and have no way of fixing yourself that I say thank you for cell phone technology and uh, the internets <laughs> just helps a lot. Union Station bus deck. It requires you going up two levels. I was able to get up the escalator even with the Brompton completely loaded. It took a little time to figure out the bus loading zone when I was up there. If you've ever been in any bus station, for any major city, it's often like that. Portland, it makes me realize Portland is set up really nicely, I think, but um, DC's is, is complicated because it's just a really big bus terminal. Um, once I got there, it was totally no nonsense. You got the tickets, we were loaded, and we were gone. I'm not sure if the second ticket was necessary, but nobody else had two bags, and I think it was a smart way to go. Bus is about half full, and we're going to be going to one more city en route, and that's going to be Morgantown, West Virginia, which is where West Virginia University is. Probably adds about two hours to the whole, whole trip, but that's also because of these half-hour stops, which, frankly, I was kind of down with because I never got coffee or breakfast on the way out of town, so kind of good to do this. That's about it from the rest stop here, and uh, we'll talk more as we get to Pittsburgh. From Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it is the end of day zero, which was basically a travel day. And uh, I got a chance to do something I rarely get a chance to do in Pittsburgh, and that is to enjoy Pittsburgh for at least an afternoon and an evening. Um, I ended up uh, staying at the Southside Travelers Inn, which is relatively new. In fact, so new they, they don't have a doorbell yet. <laughs> I mean, that's how new they are. But um, it's reasonable accommodations. You have other options in the city of Pittsburgh, but not, I think, at this price point that are this nice based on just sort of what I'm seeing. There's, I think, competing Airbnbs and maybe there's a hotel. I think it's a Holiday Inn Express or something like that. But I think that you'd be paying more money for 
similar accommodations. You do have shared bathrooms, but frankly, does that really matter? They have like multiple bathrooms. There's only one other person here tonight. And uh, it turns out that I saw her down downstairs in the common living area and that was it. And she was very nice. So I think that this is a really cool place to stay. It's something to consider Southside Traveler's Rest. It is literally blocks off of the Great Allegheny Passage. Now, it's not on the same side of the river as Point State Park, so you're not in downtown, but that's actually a bonus because here on the south side, you're going to have essentially all of the nightlife and all of the really kind of, I'll be honest, cool parts of Pittsburgh, all within walking distance and certainly within biking distance. Uh, one thing that I thought was really nice about this place, although they don't let you take your bike inside, they have a secure garage for your biking and your camping equipment. And in fact, you cannot bring your bike or camping equipment into the rooms. Of course, you can bring a bag with your clothes and stuff like that, which was just fine. And frankly, that's probably all I would have wanted to do anyways. But, you know, once I had the bike in a secure place, and this is the Brompton too, so it's, it's probably a little bit more... Mm, thievable, I suppose. I, you know, I was like, you know what? I think I feel like walking. I'm going to be spending plenty of time in the saddle in the next few days. So yeah, I just walked down, I think it's Court Street or whatever the main drag is around here. And, you know, it's just like bar after bar, restaurant after restaurant, coffee shop after coffee shop, just a lot of very cool places. And like, in all sorts of different genres, including, you know, your dive bars all the way up to your kind of frou-frou beer bar. Um, I ended up at a place called The Tap Room, which was fantastic. And that was one of the recommendations from one of the folks here at Southside Traveler's Rest. And that was excellent. I, of course, got no Pittsburgh beers. <laughs> I ended up getting, because they are such a really good beer bar, they had some really good beers from uh, breweries that I really like, even though they're starting to become less than just regional breweries. I got uh, a fresh hop beer from Deschutes, which frankly is kind of tricky to get. Um, uh, unless you're at a really good place because there's only X number of kegs on the East Coast for that. And then I ended up with something from Stone Brewing out of San Diego, which is one of my favorites. But it is basically like a Mexican hot chocolate stout. It was so good. Very good. Uh, really delicious. And poutine for for dinner. Basically, it was a perfect kind of uh, night. So that was really great. And I also got to stretch the legs a bit after kind of a long bus ride bus ride went really well. It uh, was, I don't have much to say about it other than it was very just the facts, ma'am. You know, it was like, I get to I get to the uh, Union Station stop, I give the ticket, we get on, we go, we stop two times, um, once for a half hour, uh, kind of stretch your legs, use the bathroom kind of break, and another time in Morgantown, West Virginia, and boom, we're in Pittsburgh. And we were a few minutes late, but it really wasn't a big deal. You're literally steps away from uh, Point State Park in downtown Pittsburgh uh, at the Greyhound Station there. Worked out really, really well. It was from there, I think, I think it might have taken me 10 minutes to bike to Southside Traveler's Rest, which was great. And uh, yeah, I mean, everything sort of hit the mark today. So that's really exciting. One of the things that I discovered on my way here was that the weather has taken a turn for the worse. Um, my dreams of cold but dry <laughs> have been replaced with um, basically cold and wet. <laughs> and that's going to be a problem, I think, mostly on Friday. I think tomorrow as I leave here, I'm, it, this is Wednesday night as I said here, Thursday should be okay. Thursday should have kind of a cold start. It'll be in the 30s, which is not so bad considering what's coming. Um, and it'll warm up into the 50s as the day goes along. So tomorrow, I think my intention is let's get as far as reasonable and go to the outer campground that I was uh, going for, and that would be Connellsville. So that'll be about 62 miles, give or take, from where I'm at right now. Maybe, maybe a touch less since I'm already on the south side of the bridge. Excuse me, south side of the river. And, um, you know, that's it, it's, it should be pretty easy going. I'll be going through some towns of note. And, uh, you know, through the industrial area here on the uh, other side of Pittsburgh. And then it slowly gets into more rural and rural places. And 
then it gets really nice. Um, Connellsville, of course, is a town with an Amtrak option. In fact, it's the last Amtrak option until Cumberland. So, you know, once I leave there, it's sort of like, okay, what's the the point of it? Where is the point of no return going to be? Um, That'll be something I'll have to deal with later. So tomorrow looks to be a cold but reasonably doable day. I run warm. I ride warm. I've said that before. It shouldn't be a problem. After that, sort of previewing the day two of the ride, it looks like I'm going to get up, and if the forecast holds as it is forecast, I'll have a bit of dryness before I start, and then there's a chance of rain pretty much all day, and it's going to be probably just above freezing when I start riding, and it's probably going to remain that way all the way until um, I complete my day wherever that ends up being. Um, then it's going to dip way below freezing into the evening, probably drop into the 20s. So that is not super ideal. So I will be wet and perhaps setting up a, uh, a tent in the rain. So I am uh, I'm, I'm making sure that I have some indoor options for Friday night. And there are a couple of towns where there are places where I do know that there are indoor options. I, I think that um, a lot just depends on how I feel and how the weather really ends up going. Um, I know that when I did this <laughs> very similar type of ride back in Washington in March, I found myself kind of fatigued by the end of the day, but the terrain was a lot different. There were there were a lot more hills involved. I think on the much more flat or slightly uphill surface that I'll be going on, who knows? Now, I have historically had issues with that very stretch. Why do I always get rain during that stretch? But I do. Um, between uh, Connellsville and, say, oh, Rockport. Rockport? Is it Rockport? Rockford, anyways, down that direction or up that direction. Um, The the trail drains, but it drains slowly, and it's like riding in a wet ashtray at times, which can be a little frustrating. Um, So I don't know how far I'm going to go. I've got kind of a short day option and a long day option. Um, If if I'm feeling good when I get to uh, um, Confluence, I think I've only got about another 20 miles to go to sort of the long day option. Um, It would be a little bit cheaper to go to the long day option by about 25 bucks. So that would be kind of my personal hope. (laughs) And then that would also mean that my final day, which will be very cold, would be that much better because I'm also going to have a downhill section with which will make an artificial wind chill on top of the 30 degree max cold that I'm going to have. And getting into Cumberland on the early side would be better. But if Friday is a real hellscape of riding, I think I will call it early just because, you know, I'll need to get warm and need to get inside if um, if things really are that bad. You know, there is a middle option and that is, hey, if things aren't that bad, if the rain is kind of stop and start and I'm feeling okay and I would like to camp, there is kind of an option uh, to wild camp really about halfway in between there. So um, that'll be Friday, Saturday. As I mentioned, it's just going to be straight up cold. I think uh, waking up and it'll be in the 20 degree mark and it's just going to barely get into the 30s through the day. And uh, I've got, of course, that long downhill into Cumberland that will kind of finish up the ride portion. And then the the bottom's just going to drop out of the temperatures. I think that the low that night is going to be about 18 degrees. I am intending to camp through that since it will be dry, but we're just going to have to see about that. There are, of course, lodging options in Cumberland. So when all of a sudden done, I may be indoors much more than I intended on this trip, but we will just have to see how it goes. This is how bike touring can be sometimes. Luckily, I do have the capability to fund the the overnights as necessary, but um, would prefer not to because I was kind of looking forward to a lot of camping. Foliage looks like it's um, mostly on the ground, <laughs> unfortunately, but there are still some beautiful spots. And as we were driving, or the bus was driving through some of the areas uh, like Mount, uh, Mount Savage and other areas on the Gap that I know I'd be going through. There are definitely some leaves on the trees. I don't know if they're going to survive Friday's storm, so we'll just have to see how it all ends up going. So a fun, nice start on day zero. Um, some bad news, I guess I'll call it. Um, this is going to be more of a slog than it is going to be pure joy, but sometimes slogs can be joyful. So off we go.
That there is a train full of coal. I used to watch this show. I think it's called Coal Miners. I think it's one of the last TV shows that I ever well, actually watched on television. Uh, and the, uh, the line, I used to watch this with Mysterious James, and the line was, mining coal is all I know. I'm sorry to all folks who are of Appalachian heritage for me massacring your regional dialect. But that's where I am here as I start climbing into uh, the mountains a little bit. I'm ah, climbing. I'm still hugging the Allegheny River. And I will be doing that for a long period of time here until I get to the Yakagani. And again, I think I'm mispronouncing that, but that is the name of it. A lot of coal. You were worried about the coal industry. You're worried about coal. Don't be. The trade's full of it. Advantage to cycling in the fall. The amount of, the difference in the amount of hydration that I require is so different. Like I, I you know, I'm, I'm in the camp of drink when you're thirsty and not drink before you're thirsty. And it, that usually works for me. But uh, I have had, I think, one sip out of my water bottle this entire ride so far. I am, let's see, last I checked it was about 50 miles out. I have to cross the tracks a few times. And uh, so there are hills of note. Here we go down. Hope you can hear it. are all made of this really nice composite decking, but it makes a racket when you go down. Uh, going by a pipe fitting factory where there's tons of steel pipes. Um, and this used to be, this used to not be paved, I think, uh, which is great that it is, because this used to be uh, a road where you were kind of on an unpaved, potholy area. So this is kind of nice. Uh, the, this might even be recent, but I could be wrong. It doesn't look like it's super recent, but I haven't been up this direction, geez, in a couple years. I think it's been a couple years since I was last here. But anyways, the trail's been great so far. I've really enjoyed the scenery on the opposite bank of the river. It's been just glorious and beautiful. There's still plenty of foliage up, so I'm kind of hoping that the whole uh, situation with the foliage stays that way. Getting close to Duquesne, which of course is a college town uh, on the Burbish side of things here in Pittsburgh, and things are going well. Really enjoying the ride. Uh, hoping to bang out those miles, as I say, and uh, getting some good pictures and some good video. This is the, this, 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 is the industrial outskirts of, Port, of Pittsburgh. I almost went to Portland. And it's, it, it's strangely beautiful. I think that industrial chic has become a thing. The bar I was at last night was yet another one of those brick-walled, former warehouse type places, and uh, I feel like that that's that, that look, that sort of beat-up, old chain-link look, exposed brick, that, that's become such a thing, and if you like that look, you should do the Great Allegheny Passage, especially up by Pittsburgh, because that's what you get for a good chunk of the day. Um, you get, let's see, I'm about uh, out of Duquesne in a moment here. A lot of like kind of warehousey places and stuff like that, but things are starting to spread out a lot more uh, as opposed to closer into Pittsburgh. I think I mentioned this on past shows. There's a lot of history. Of course, there's the uh, Homestead Strike area. This is a little piece of Americana that I think is worth noting. I'll read the sign. A homestead strike on the morning of July 6th, 1892, on the orders of Carnegie Steel Company, 300 Pinkerton agents attempted to land near here. Strikers, citizens, repulsed them. Seven workers, three Pinkertons were killed. 8,000 state militia arrived July 12. By November, the strike was broken. This, this is a very sanitized version of what went down here. Uh, the Carnegie Steel Corporation 
hired private thugs, the Pinkerton agents, to come and break a strike that was going on of the workers that were there. Eventually it was broken, but um, it's a piece of American history that is worth learning more about. Um, and learning more about the Pinkerton Company? Google, Google that. <laughs> it's, it's a fascinating piece of history. But uh, here, uh, a bit of labor history right here at the uh, uh, site of the Homestead Strike, what Homestead, Pennsylvania is best known for. Uh, there's also a lot of information uh, that, that are on signs all around here. Uh, just the, the, the notion of Pittsburgh and the surrounding area being what built uh, America during the early younger days. <laughs> um, it's, it's very much there, but it's kind of it's kind of transitioned a lot, as with a lot of manufacturing. So Pittsburgh was struggling for years and years and transitioned into basically information technology and medical technology and has just blossomed um, as a result. I, I, I strongly recommend if you are not from the U.S. or if you are in the U.S. and you've never been to Pittsburgh, check it out. It's it's quite a cool town, a lot of, a lot of good vibes, very friendly people. Um, I think I mentioned yesterday I was taking a vi about to take a video and somebody asked, hey, would you like me to take your picture for you? And I was like, oh no, that's cool. I was just going to do a video. But uh, that's the kind of thing I don't get in D.C. Got a little bit of a highway over on my right side, but it's really quiet today. Uh, it is a Thursday morning, but uh, it doesn't seem, it seems like the, any, any workday traffic has long since passed around here. Going to be going through the town of Boston, Pennsylvania in a little bit. Uh, I believe there's a, there's a bar there that I've been to a couple of times, usually when it's just crazy hot and I need a little break from the sun. And, uh, you know, it's like $2 yinglings and stuff like that. It's a little on the early side for that for me. So I think I'm going to keep continuing uh, through Boston. There's also McKeesport. I might be going through McKeesport first. McKeesport's got kind of a rough reputation. Um, but apparently they're going to be rebuilding how the Great Allegheny Passage goes through the town a little bit rather than have it go uh, behind, I, I guess that's the bus terminal or the police station or something like that. They may make it be elevated and uh, have good good access to some of the local businesses. And that would be good because McKeesport could kind of use that. And it feels like um, there's not a, lot, not a lot going on there. And I don't, I don't say that flippantly. I feel like that these trail towns tend to benefit from the trails. And I, I, I hope that what they're talking about doing in McKeesport will help that town because uh, it's got some history there as well. There's a, uh, I think a statue of John Kennedy. He came and did some, I guess, campaigning there or something like that. It was a famous speech that was delivered there. It's in a little park, not, not too far off. Um, I usually stop at a gas station there, but since I've had plenty of food and I'm not in need of any more until further on down, I think I'm going to just roll right through. Uh, once you get out of there, it's interesting, the Keysport, I believe, if I recall correctly, has also like a little hostel kind of a thing that the town runs, but I can't imagine that it's open now. Um, anytime I've gone by it, it's always closed, even kind of the height of summer, so I wonder if that's something they tried and decided not to do. Uh, hey, you never hear me say this. The sun feels really good. Uh, I'm wearing a black merino wool sweater as my outer layer, and it's absorbing that warmth really nicely. Um, I actually had my rain jacket on earlier and had to take it off because I was sweating so much. So, as usual, I ride a little warm. The forecast, as I have mentioned, I feel like I've mentioned it a million times, but might have been in the, the session that just didn't record. Will be very cold. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how well my sleeping bag per performs tonight. Um, I do intend to camp tonight because uh, Connellsville has a nice setup there. Although I will say, I've heard some folks. Uh, reach out to me saying that they have had some encounters there that have been less than great. Uh, I have had uh, not poor encounters, but I have had sort of like you can tell there's people there who are kind of staying there. Um, 
which may speak more to the economy of the local area a little bit and uh, what folks have to go through. I've never had a problem. I've never felt uncomfortable, um, but we'll see how that goes. I don't know what it would be like tonight. It's going to be quite cold, so I hope if anybody is without a home, they're not relying on those uh, very not warm shelters. Um, I do have stuff to get me through a pretty cold night. I've got the down bag for tonight. I've also got a fleece liner that I intend to get into as well. So I think between all of that, I should be okay. Kind of an open question how the next day or two is going to go. But to be continued, I'm about to cross one of the prettier, nicer bridges going across the river here. So I will sign out right now. Statistics for days zero and one of the ride. Bus miles logged 288. Bike miles biked 31 in the half day or so that you've heard so far. Pittsburgh overnight one. Beers two. And very good ones, I might add. Putin servings one. It was enormous. Thank you to the bartender who stopped me from getting more than that. Mocking pro Syracuse University pictures taken outside Pittsburgh Panthers training facility. Didn't mention this on the pod. One. And little clown bikes. One. Water bottle refills. Zero. It's fall. And flats. Zero. Coming up in part two of Pedal Shift Tour Journals, volume 12, Great Allegheny Passage by Brompton. I just got a sign that said, last water till Whitsit. That's great. I don't know what that means. <laughs> A little chillier than I think uh, I would have liked. We like to close out the show with a big thank you to all of the supporters of the Pedal Shift Project through the Pedal Shift Society. If you like what you hear, you can help maintain Pedal Shift as an independent listener supported voice while expanding the offerings. We're talking five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month helps with the cost of hosting the podcast the website, and more. And you can do it for a little bit. Cancel anytime. One Shot Support's welcome if you're not into the whole small monthly thing. And you can check it all out and join at pedalship.net slash society. On to the society. Ethan Georgie, Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lane, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Dittus, Thomas Skadow, Seth Krieger, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Noah Schroer, Harry Telgatis, John Sikorsky, Richard Killian, Chris Barron, Brian Wren, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hepwell, Paul Mulvey, Stuart Bucket, Todd Stutz, Mr. T, Roxy Arning, Nathan Poulton, Harry Hugel, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Ruth Divorcey, Michelle Miller, Matthew Lewis, Michael Baker, Billy Crafton, Paul Culbertson, Scott Culbertson, Matt Perry, Danielle Jepson, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Bobby Rupel, Roy Everett, Greg Braithwaite, John Mayer, William Cairns, Sandy Pizio, Richard Patch, Mark Messer, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Dave Roll, Joseph Quinn, John Baxter, Susan Brewster, Drew Porter, Brian Patterson, and thank you to all anonymous and past contributors for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available. 